Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Anne-Sophie Corbeau, and I am a Global Research Scholar at the Center on Global Energy Policy. Today, we are going to discuss the findings from the IES just released gas quarterly report. Let me quickly say that this event is being webcast live and the full video will be available online in the coming days. For those of you joining us via Zoom, you can submit a question for the panelists at any time by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We're happy to share that our events are now closed captioned. You can turn the captions on by clicking the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and then selecting show subtitles. The changes that we have seen on global gas market over the past two years have been dramatic. I mean, we have moved from a situation of global oversupply in 2020, prices at record lows, LNG exports shut in, and a drop of international trade. And now we are exactly in the opposite situation, in a situation of unprecedented tightness on global gas market. And the result of that are record high gas prices. European gas port prices spiked at up to $60 per MMBTU just before Christmas. This is the equivalent of $350 per barrel. And even though they have now come down to around $25 per MMBTU, there is still considerable uncertainty on what the year 2022 will look like. Additionally, this market tightening is happening in the context of very tense geopolitical relationships between Europe and the US on one side and Russia on the other. We are delighted to welcome Akos Loss, who is energy analyst at the International Energy Agency and also a non-resident fellow at the Center on Global Energy. Akos is going to present the main findings of the gas quarterly review. We have also with us two excellent experts on global gas markets. Dr. Tatiana Mitrova, who is a board director of Novatech and Schlumberger. She's also professor at the Skolkovo Moscow School of Management and a non-resident fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy, as well as Andrew Walker, a VP for Strategy at Junior Marketing. Thank you for joining us. And uh, both of them are going to give some initial reactions to the main findings of the report. I am now going to give the floor to Akos. Akos, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anne-Sophie. Let me just real quickly share my screen. And, and off we go. Thank you. So again, it's great to be back at Colombia. As you mentioned briefly, Colombia and the Center on Global Energy Policy is a very special place for me. I went to grad school at Colombia and also before I joined the IA, I worked at the center in various capacities for a total of five years. So it's a really special privilege to bring you the latest findings of our quarterly gas market report, which we published just yesterday. Uh, before I start, let me just say for those who do not follow our work very closely that we now publish quarterly gas market reports with an updated short-term forecast every three months. When I joined the IA, there was only one big annual report every year. And, you know, initially we were a bit worried that uh, we will not have enough fresh material to fill a new report every quarter. But ever since we made the switch to more frequent uh, publication schedule, it seems that the market has switched gears too, and it's been producing some really dramatic twists and turns every every quarter. So, so here are the findings from the late, latest one. So I guess the topic that's been grabbing the headlines in recent months is, of course, the price environment. You also mentioned this in your introduction. So let me start my presentation right here. And 2021, as you said, was truly for the record books. In Europe, the TTF price averaged about $16 per MMBTU in 2021. This is uh, almost five times higher than in 2020, and it's an absolute record in a yearly basis. In the fourth quarter of last year, the TTF averaged more than $31 per MMBTU, also an all-time high. And the daily peak, which is shown in this uh, sharp spike in late December, above $60 per MMBTU is just absolutely beyond what anyone could imagine before before last year. Asian spot prices followed a very similar trend. They broke all previous records on an annual, quarterly, and daily basis uh, last year. Just want to note here that uh, the previous daily record was also this smaller spike here in, in, in early January uh, during the winter energy crisis in Asia. And we thought this was uh, pretty dramatic at the time, but uh, this winter's price spike to nearly $50 per MMBTU clearly shattered that record within, within less than just 12 months. 
And even in the US, uh, you know, the Henry Uprise uh, almost doubled from their 2020 levels and averaged close to $4 per MMBTU in 2021 as a whole. And in Q4, Henry Up was close to $5 per MMBTU, which is the highest for, for the fourth quarter since the early days of the shale revolution back in 2008. So uh, prices in Europe and Asia did not only uh, reach extreme high levels last year, but they were also extremely volatile. Uh, you know, in normal times, the TTF and the Asian spot LNG price used to move by a few, a few cents from one day to the other, uh, or by one or two dollars per MMBTU if something really dramatic was happening. But in this uh, in, in this three week stretch in in, in December this uh, last year, uh, which is this really sharp swing of the blue line, uh, the TTF price in Europe climbed from around thirty dollars to sixty dollars per MMBTU in just a few days before it collapsed back to twenty dollars by the end of the month. And during this time, we saw price moves approaching or exceeding ten dollars per MMBTU within a single day. So this is clearly a sign of a market that is that is out of balance. On my next slide, uh, I want to take a look at the demand side of this balance first. Uh, we estimate that global gas demand growth was around 4.6% last year. This is a preliminary figure based on partial data, and it will most likely be refined further in our next report. But as you can see on the left-hand chart, this is actually a very strong growth rate. In percentage terms, this is the second fastest growth rate in a, in a decade. And in absolute terms, this is equivalent to an increase of more than 180 BCM or 17 BCF per day. This is this would be the third highest annual increment uh, ever recorded, uh, which you can see on the right-hand chart. Uh, this um, massive growth in demand should perhaps come as no surprise. We had the fastest global economic recovery in 80 years uh, last year, which itself gave a strong boost to gas demand. And on top of this, we also had colder than average winter across the Northern Hemisphere. And we had an unusually long heating season in Europe, which lasted well into the spring. And we had a series of extreme weather events like heat waves, droughts, and at times even very low wind speeds in Europe. And all this unusual weather created additional demand for gas. So this is where the uh, exceptional uh, the high growth rate comes from last year. In fact, uh, if you look at this next slide, you can see that demand growth could have been even stronger in 2021, but uh, high prices actually started to suppress demand from the second half of the year. So you can see on the left, uh, global gas demand increased by close to 7% year on year in the first half of 2021, but only less than 3% in the second half. And you know, one of the ways in which high prices led to demand erosion was through fuel switching and outright demand destruction in the industrial sector, which you can see on my other chart on the right. And, you know, in some of the most important markets, including China, which is which is the one of the biggest growth market for industrial gas demand, uh, we saw negative year on year growth rates for industry from around September. Uh, you know, companies in energy intensive industries like fertilizers, glass and steel making uh, were pretty much forced to cut production due to high prices uh, in, in, in many of these, many of these uh, important markets for industrial gas demand. So this is one of the, one of the effects of, of high prices and besides demand destruction in industry, the other dark side of the high gas price environment was a return to coal fire generation and power generation. Now we, we published some stark numbers on this in our annual energy market report, which came out just a few weeks ago. This showed that we had a new record in both coal-fired generation and also power sector emissions last year. Of course, some of this coal-fired generation rebound was, was clearly due to structural growth, but some of it was, was due to fuel switching. And on these two charts, I show the US and the European situation. As you can see, this kind of fuel switching was ongoing uh, pretty much all year in the United States. So gas uh, coal-fired generation was up by 19%, whereas gas-fired generation was down by 3% in 2021. And from the second half of 2021, it was also starting to play out in Europe, where coal-fired generation grew by 11% in the year as a whole, and gas-fired generation was down by 1% last year. Although, um, Data on oil fire generation is a bit more patchy. There's also evidence that fuel switching occurred between uh, gas to oil, 
and this was mainly for picking requirements in mature economies and for base load requirements in, in emerging markets like Pakistan and Bangladesh. If you look at the next slide, uh, we can we can see that on the supply side, uh, this strong demand growth that I just described, notwithstanding the headwinds uh, that I just mentioned, coincided with the lower than expected supply availability. Uh, the most visible sign of this underperformance was the high level of LNG capacity outages, which you can see on my left chart. We estimate that more than 50 BCM of LNG supply was lost uh, due to planned or unplanned outages last year. And this is equivalent to nearly 9% of main plate capacity. Uh, this was more than 40% higher than the average volume lost to planned and unplanned outages in the 2015 to 2020 period. And if you exclude the long-term disruption in Yemen, then about half of these unplanned outages uh, in volume terms were due to upstream feed gas availability issues, which were especially acute in Nigeria, Trinidad and Tobago, and, and Malaysia. So upstream uh, supply also fell short of expectation in key gas producing regions, not just specifically for LNG production. In the first nine months of 2021, we estimated that about 11 BCM of North Sea production was lost to uh, extended maintenance. This was partly deferred maintenance from 2020 due to COVID related restrictions. And in Russia, you know, the production of gas prom, which accounts for about two thirds of Russian supply, it was down by 35 BCM compared to the company's stated production capacity, despite the fact that we had record high prices in Europe and, and also very strong domestic demand in Russia. And the third area is in the US where gas production increased, but only by less than 2% in 2021. And this is despite the fact that annual prices more than doubled from, from the previous year over the same period. Uh, on my right hand chart, you can see that um, uh, you know, low spending levels could present uh, further challenges for upstream performance in the future. Uh, we can see here that upstream spending directed to natural gas has been on a declining trend since the beginning of the last decade. And in 2020 and 2021, it actually was even below the level which is consistent with our net zero by 2050 scenario over the next decade, not to mention the stated policy scenario which requires more than twice the amount of investment that, that we have seen in the last two years. So the current high price environment could actually provide some strong incentives for producers to increase upstream spending, but, uh, but the traditional link between prices and spending levels may be weaker today than in the past. This is due to the uncertainties around future demand, due to the capital discipline on the part of the producers, and also due to investor pressures to move away from fossil fuels. So we could very well see a relatively muted supply response despite the high price environment this time around. Now, besides the high prices, the other hot topic today is, of course, Russian gas supplies to Europe. So let me put out a few numbers here to set the scene for our discussion. Uh, I'm sure Tatiana will, will also have more on this in her comments. First, uh, Russia did produce uh, record levels in 2021. We estimate that their domestic production was up by about 10% last year, which is equivalent to nearly 70 BCM or 7 BCF per day. Uh, this is an increase within a single year. Just for comparison, this is as much gas as the total consumption of it Italy, which is the second largest gas market of Europe. So a huge volume increase in, in their domestic production. Uh, and the domestic consumption was also up by about 10% or nearly 50 BCM. According to our estimate, this was uh, probably also a record. And these demand numbers do not include the net storage injection, which were also very substantial last year. So last winter was very cold in Russia and long. So domestic storage facilities were almost completely depleted by the spring. And this had to be refilled during the injection season, which ran until early November. But even so, Russia was able to increase its exports to countries outside the former Soviet Union by about 3% or 6 BCM last year, as you can see on this dark, dark blue bar. Well, the problem for the EU was, of course, that all of this increase in exports went to China and Turkey. So export to China went up by more than 150%. 
as the deliveries through the power Siberia pipeline were ramping up and deliveries to Turkey were up by more than 60% through both the Turk Stream and the Blue Stream pipelines. At the same time, uh, deliveries to the EU as a whole were actually down by about 3% last year, according to our estimates. And I should add that this decline was from an already low basis in 2020. Now, if we break this down even further, uh, we can see that this is where the real squeeze comes. Uh, deliveries to the EU were actually up by around 6% in the first three quarters of, quarters of 2021, but they fell off sharply by about 25% in the last quarter, quarter of uh, 2021, and they have remained pretty low ever since. So uh, from the European perspective, this last quarter of, uh, of 2021 looked, looked like this. Uh, that Europe in the chart that I'm about to show corresponds to the definition of our, our wider European region, which includes both Turkey and the UK. So demand in, in this wider Europe region was actually pretty much flat year on year. So uh, this was mainly due to the headwinds from the industrial demand destruction that I, that I mentioned a few slides earlier. Uh, so there was no particular demand spike to offset only the drop of Russian flows, which uh, which were down by about 11 BCM or 25% in this wider Europe region. Um, to offset this, we, we could turn to North Africa, but this was actually not much help. Uh, you know, uh, this was mainly because one of the transit routes for Algerian gas was, was done from, from the end of October when Algeria decided to discontinue gas transit through the Maghreb pipeline via Morocco. So, uh, so North African gas deliveries were actually flat year on year in the, in the last quarter of 2021. Norway actually went out of its way to, to respond to European calls for higher supplies, including by raising production caps and also by diverting field gas to Europe that is normally reserved for reinjection to boost oil production. But even these measures uh, provided only an upside of about 2 BCM of incremental gas in Q4. Now the trans adriatic pipeline, which, which, which is now fully operational and connects Azerbaijan with Europe, was also run at maximum capacity and this meant another two, two to three BCM of additional gas in, in Q4 compared to the same period in the previous year. Uh, but you know, the pipeline options were relatively quickly exhausted and, and this meant that the bulk of the balancing was left to LNG and European LNG imports were actually up by more than 50% year on year. And nearly half of this LNG uh, came from, incremental LNG came from the US. These trends were even more pronounced in January so far uh, when European LNG imports were more than double the level a year ago and US LNG made up more than 70% of the additional LNG that arrived in Europe uh, so far in January. Uh, uh, now I, I have to add that I, deliberately choose this uh, somewhat odd title for the slide, American Gas to the Rescue, because, uh, uh, because uh, the very first paper I actually worked at Columbia back in 2014 was called American Gas to the Rescue. And it basically argued that the flexible US LNG that was about to come to the market will greatly benefit European consumers and improve European energy security in the event of a supply disruption. And I'm pleased to say that this is exactly playing out as we envisaged in, in that report. So US LNG is indeed coming to, the, to Europe's rescue, not because of any policy intervention to redirect flows, but simply because of its inherent flexibility to respond to market price signals. So shifting gears here a little bit, uh, it's understandable that the current gas market turbulence and the issues around Russian gas flows capture all the attention. But uh, we also wanted to emphasize that the more, uh, how shall I say, mundane, uh, but still critical work of implementing gas market reports uh, still continued in 2021, despite all the market turbulence. In our report, we put these policy initiatives in three different categories. Uh, so first, we saw important market opening reforms with the adoption of the new gas law in Brazil and the Petroleum Industry Act in Nigeria, for example. 
and we also saw proposals to overhaul pipeline tariffs in China and to unbundle gale in India, to name just a few important policy initiatives on this front. Our second category includes policy responses to these successive energy crises that we saw throughout the year, such as the tightening of the regulatory requirements around LNG stocks in Korea and Japan, new weatherization rules in Texas, and also a policy toolkit by the European Commission to help governments deal with the impact of high natural gas prices. And the third category includes uh, low carbon gas policies, including some that are looking to reduce GHG emissions along the gas supply chain, like the Global Methane Pledge and the EU's proposed methane regulation, and also the EU's hydrogen and, and decarbonized gas markets package, which is trying to facilitate the system integration of low carbon gases into the gas grid. So um, bottom line is behind the traumatic headlines, there's also important gas market reforms and policy initiatives underway. Finally, um, let me give you a few highlights from our expectations for 2022. Um, we believe that 2021 in many ways was a perfect storm and we do not expect, we, we do expect the market to cool down a bit this year. We expect global gas demand growth to slow from 4.6% to just around 1% this year. And this is due to lower economic growth, normalizing weather conditions, which we assume in our forecast, and also continuing headwinds from high prices, especially in the first half of the year. We also expect LNG trade growth to slow down from 6% to to 4% this year, uh, mainly because we expect the 2021 demand boom in Asia to moderate and that the drought driven rise in South American LNG demand uh, to reverse. There's also a change in the top of the LNG league tables. So this year, China already undertook Japan as the biggest importer of LNG and its lead is only expected to widen further in 2022. And also we expect the US to overtake Australia in 2022 as the biggest exporter of LNG. And it will also have the world's biggest capacity for LNG exports by the end of uh, this year. And overall, Asia will account for all net growth in LNG imports, whereas uh, the US accounts for about 75% of the export growth next year. So I hope that this gives us enough to discuss um, in the rest of the hour. Just to recap, here are some of our takeaways once again. So prices broke records in 2021, and they could remain high, remain high in much of 2022 as well. Gas consumption growth was very strong in 2021, but high prices started to erode this demand uh, from the second half of the year. This took the form of both industrial demand destruction and also fuel switching uh, to coal and oil in power generation. Strong growth in 2021 was met with lower than expected supply, both as a result of LNG capacity outages and overall upstream underperformance. Russian pipeline deliveries to Europe de declined especially sharply during the fourth quarter of last year, and this was primarily offset by increased LNG imports. And we do expect gas demand and LNG trade both to cool down in 2022 as the economic growth and the extreme weather patterns saw so in 2021 return to normal. So with this, I thank you very much for your attention and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Sakos, for this excellent presentation. Um, I would like to give now the floor to Andrew Walker for some initial remarks. Andrew, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Anne-Sophie. Um, thank you, Akos, for um, a great um, presentation and, and overview. Um, once again, it's great to see the uh, quarterly report shine a light into uh, really what's happening in the in the gas markets. And I've, I've kind of noted five things that I want to comment on very briefly, really on the top, of, on the back of your uh, presentation. Um, as I kind of uh, moving us towards um, general Q&A. Firstly, uh, the first thing I noted, you, you'd increased your uh, assessment of gas demand uh, for 2021, which I wasn't surprised at. I think, um, you know, the, as you quite rightly commented, the prices are telling us that the market's out of balance. Um, the question is, you know, how did we get to this um, quite extreme uh, position from where we were 2020? And, and actually looking at the growth, um, you know, your, your previous assessment, 3.6% uh, 
sounded slightly low in comparison to kind of the feel of the market at the moment. So I'm not surprised to see it go up. 180 BCM, though, as you yourself pointed out, is still not the largest increment we've ever seen. So it's, it's large, but it's not unprecedented. In fact, it's only the third largest we've seen in a couple of decades. Um, but my second point, and as you quite rightly pointed out, that the, the, the balance or the lack of balance is not just about the growth on the demand side, it's about what's happening on supply. And supply is not keeping pace with the uh, rebound uh, in demand. Uh, supply um, in, in a number of places, uh, Russia, and I'm going to let um, Tatiana uh, focus on Russian gas and I'll take the LNG piece, as you pointed out, LNG um, utilization factors have been quite low in the non-US uh, piece of the um, supply chain uh, this year. And so I guess a key question, and it's a key question for all of, in terms of all of these different pieces, in terms of thinking about the market balance, are we seeing short-term factors, supply chain, COVID impacts on oper operations, or are there more structural uh, factors at play? Um, what I would note is that when I look at the non-US piece of um, supply, uh, the non-US supply countries, I look and I look back at 2019, they're actually producing 15 million tons less uh, product than they were two years ago, which is unexpected because we, we weren't expecting any capacity to come offline. Now, some of it's um, apparent Norway clearly snowed it offline uh, because of the fire that took place there coming back online. Other places, Nigeria, um, Trinidad, Peru, et cetera, slightly less clear um, about what's happening. So obviously we're watching that very closely to see if of the, ver of the various dials that we have to try and get the markets back into balance, whether uh, additional LNG supply is one of those dials. Um, a few more very brief points. I think your charts, your very good charts in the presentation and in the report show that actually to understand the market at the moment, you have to look at the narrative on a quarter by quarter basis. It's, it's changing that rapidly. So as you say, we're seeing quite large inflows into Europe now um, as Europe signals LNG. I like the um, reference back to the uh, American uh, LNG to the rescue. I remember um, remember that report. So to understand what's happening, you know, I think we had a year in which Asia filled uh, early, filled its LNG uh, capacity uh, storage early, based on its experience last winter. So it was very cautious, and now we're kind of having seen it fill, having seen it have quite a mild winter so far. We're seeing the volumes flow into Europe. I think the point was well made that US LNG has been a big um, addition to the global marketplace and in terms of ability to balance, to reorient flows, um, not only this year, but also remember last year where we, where we balanced the market in terms of moderating supply, but clearly large amounts of volume reorienting between different marketplaces at the moment, Europe importing records amount of LNG, US and others in January. My final couple of points, I think to understand what's happening, you have to kind of look outside of LNG, outside of gas and into the wider energy spectrum. Um, you need to understand what's happening in power, in coal, in oil, in uh, various pieces. So I think we won't understand the full picture until you publish your global energy report, uh, which is normally about April. I'm interested to see that. It just feels like we're in a very tight energy market. I noticed that your electricity report indicated we had um, a record amount of electricity demand growth um, last year. And then finally, I think you're still too cautious in terms of growth. I'd be very surprised if next year is the third lowest growth in two decades based on where we kind of where the market is. And I hear your caution that we've got high prices and that will impact demand to some extent. But other than the two years that we contracted, 1% would make next year a very low year in terms of growth, half of the uh, global long-term average. I just think we're going to see more uh, growth than that. 
although perhaps you're right in LNG because we know LNG is supply constrained at the moment and it's about additional capacity coming on. Um, and part of, part of whether you're 4% turns out to be too pessimistic. And I noted you, I know you had a 4% forecast, which actually uh, turned out 6% uh, turned out to be the answer. I wonder whether next year will be the same. It's going to be on whether that LNG comes back from the non-US uh, supply that's missing and then how quickly the um, trains that are coming on over the course of this year uh, ramp up. So that's my um, comments on Sophie. I'm going to hand back to you and um, let you bring in Tatiana. Thank you very much, Andrew. Excellent comments as usual. Uh, Tatiana, I mean, what do you think, you know, coming from your Russian perspective? I mean, what is the feeling of this uh, gas market report? Yeah, thank you, Anne Sophie, and greetings from uh, cold winter Moscow. A lot of snow here. Uh, you know, the uh, report, uh, I think, reflects very well uh, this feeling of the perfect storm on the gas markets, and many of our concerns and uh, even nightmares uh, coming true. And as Akush was citing uh, his own uh, paper published, back in 2015, I believe, or 2016, uh, on this uh, US LNG to the rescue. I would also refer to some of our previous publications on the uh, European gas market and the uh, potential risks of complete liberalization of the market, which is so much dependent on imports, which is facing uh, reducing indigenous production and uh, which is basically transferring the pricing at the spot market to the um, external uh, largest uh, pipeline gas supplier, which is is Russia. So here, uh, I wouldn't say that it came completely unexpected. Uh, many analysts were discussing all those threats uh, for the energy security, especially in Europe. Uh, all those experts were discussing the threats of uh, um, complete spot indexation in the situation of this competition between Asian uh, importers and European uh, importers. And here we are in the middle of this perfect storm. Uh, there was this question about Russian gas supplies. And I mean, obviously, everybody is discussing it. Um, I would say that Akush has shown a, a pretty good picture and this detailization of Russian gas production, domestic consumption, which was extraordinarily high. I would say nobody was expecting it here in Russia as well. Uh, because um, there was, again, like globally, there was a coincidence of very uh, negative factors, very high coal prices has have moved uh, Russian coal to the exports. And so there was massive switching from coal generation to gas generation domestically. Several nuclear blocks were stopped uh, for maintenance. And so again, uh, rising demand for uh, gas fired generation uh, and economic recovery, obviously. So we've got uh, this nearly 12% uh, indigenous uh, demand growth, uh, which was uh, a bit too high. Uh, and uh, the gas producers, I think, came unprepared for that. Uh, there was a rising uh, gas export uh, to Asia, this uh, uh, pivot to the Asia, which we are discussing since uh, 2014 uh, and signing of the power of Siberia. So here we are. And uh, I think uh, this is uh, something we should keep in mind that uh, upstream investments are more and more moving there. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, though we understand that there is this unutilized uh, capacity, I wouldn't agree here with Akos and with IEA referring uh, to uh, like 555 uh, BCM stated uh, capacity uh, of Gazprom. This statement was made back in 2018. A lot has changed uh, since that uh, time and uh, this uh, destruction of uh, upstream investments in 2020, which uh, Gazprom has experienced uh, together with all the oil and gas producers. Of course, it has affected the resource base. 
plus quite unfavorable taxation uh, change uh, in Russia. So all in all, I wouldn't say that there is such a huge gas bubble uh, on which Russia is sitting and not uh, allowing uh, this gas to go to Europe. But at the same time, there is definitely some flexibility that there could be some goodwill, especially in Q4. But the question is uh, where this goodwill, uh, how this goodwill could be motivated. Uh, from the commercial side, if we look uh, clearly on the commercial rationale for Russia, for Gazprom, it doesn't make any sense to send additional export volumes uh, to the spot market on top of the long-term contracts nomination because uh, these volumes will uh, lower prices, thus affecting huge volumes which are supplied under the long-term contracts. Yeah. From the uh, purely humanitarian point of view, yeah, there could be this goodwill driven by uh, external policy, by geopolitics and the, the desire to uh, keep a good relationship with Europe. Um, but I mean, in the current geopolitical landscape, it doesn't look uh, like the case. And also the nominations, as uh, Mike Fullwood has correctly mentioned in the uh, Q&A box, uh, the nominations from the European customers have been much lower because they understand that the prices are very high. So there is also this rebalancing on the demand side. So all in all, uh, we are where we are. And I do not see any uh, rapid change uh, on the Russia side. Uh, Indeed, when the spot prices will go lower, Russia would most likely, I mean, the nominations would most likely increase and therefore the flows from Russia will increase. But basically, the key question which is raised in the IEA report, but which I think is the core part of our discussion, it is about the next uh, investment cycle. So it is very clearly shown that uh, investments under discussion are not sufficient to provide uh, the volumes needed to cover the expected gas demand. And uh, given the geopolitical instability, price volatility, uh, energy transition discussion, and uh, changing requirements from the investor community, it is really much more difficult now to go for the new FIDs. And this is, I think, the most existential threat and question for the future of the natural gas market, because even the current situation is already very challenging for the future uh, of natural gas. But if uh, such situation will remain for the years to come, I'm afraid we have a big problem. I'll stop on that. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, Tatiana uh, for these excellent comments. Uh, we are now going to move to a moderated uh, panel discussion uh, between uh, the four of us. So I would like to invite Akos, Tatiana and Andrew to come back uh, with the camera on, please. And again, for those who are watching us online, my name is Anne-Sophie Corbeau and I am here with Akos Tos, who is an energy analyst at the International Energy Agency, Dr. Tatiana Mitrova, who is board director at Novatech and Schlumberger, professor at Skolkovo Moscow School of Management and a non-resident fellow with us at CJEP, as well as Andrew Walker, VP for Strategy at Chenier Marketing. Uh, we are right now discussing the IES Gas Quarterly Review. We are going to move into a moderated discussion, and then we are going to open up to questions from the audience. I can see that a lot of questions have already uh, come uh, to in the Q&A chat. Uh, for those of you who are joining us via Zoom, please, I mean, don't hesitate to, to submit further questions for the panelists at any time uh, by clicking on the Q&A button. And of course, I mean, very interesting presentation, of course, a lot of content to absorb. And of course, there is a, the, the whole uh, report uh, to digest. I mean, as Andrew mentioned, I mean, you know, the demand is, is, is still growing. I mean, about 1%. Uh, but I mean, if you had to basically um, give the impact of different uh, items, I mean, you know, we have the high gas prices. So you, you mentioned that uh, in the report, you are assuming that Asian and European spot prices are going to be around $26, $27 per MMBT, which is extremely high. I mean, very, very high. Uh, we have also the weather effects and we have 
also a lower GDP growth. So if you were to give an assessment about you know, how these different drivers are, are impacting demand, what would it be? Yeah, it's a bit of a tricky question because we didn't provide the detailed disaggregation of these these various factors: the the uh, sort of economic slowdown, the weather normalization, and the and the and the high price environment. Uh, but I tried to try to try to run some back of the envelope calculations, and it looks like you know if, if we add up all the all the slowdown in demand from 2021 to 2022 in in the residential sector and 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 power in those regions where 2021 was the the, the jump in 2021 was temporary and weather driven especially uh, you know south america and eurasia we 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 get about you know anywhere between 50 and 70% of the slowdown in, in in this year explained by uh, by the normalization of the weather patterns and you know the rest is roughly equally split between the gdp slowdown and the negative impact of high prices so i guess that's partly uh, provides an answer to to andrew as well that uh, you know weather remains a huge huge uncertainty factor and we we tend to be uh, cautious especially towards the beginning of the year before we we see any sort of diversion from from normal norm, normal trends to 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 be cautious about being more bullish than 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 the than the sort of norm, no, normalized um, seasonal patterns would 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 justify but obviously as the year goes by uh, we'll will adjust and and if you see dramatic cold spells and extreme weather events and droughts and and um, uh, you know shortages in in, in coal and, and and other generation fuels in the world and then, then obviously um, there is room for um, much much uh, faster growth in, in in the current year so um, I guess that's a new approach that since we publish quarterly we, we allow ourselves more more room to to be um, in, initially initially um, uh, perhaps a bit cautious and then then adjust their assessments as, as, as more information becomes available. In the report, I mean, uh, you also mentioned that the global LNG trade would increase by 4%, but everything is going to Asia. So, I mean, to what extent do you see Asian countries, especially Southeast Asian countries, for which, you know, the current spot prices that we are seeing are extremely expensive. Um, so to what extent do you see these countries being impacted by, you know, these, these spot prices or are they changing their contract patterns? Yeah, so... Um... Actually, most China is still the biggest country contributor uh, to to, the, to this growth next year. Uh, but but its imports import growth dropped from around 17 percent this year to about nine percent in 2022. And this is this is mainly because we expect uh, pipeline gas flows from Russia to continue to ramp up, and also we expect a slowdown in the overall gas demand trajectory. Uh, and India India has been a bit of a disappointment this year. They saw their first LNG import decline uh, uh, since 2013, I believe, and and we, we just expect them to recover that uh, this year. So so uh, so definitely growth, but 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 overall import levels will, will not be not not be dramatically higher than than uh, perhaps we would have expected before uh, uh, before the sort of. 2020 2021 shock to the system and and we do see growth in emerging asia uh, in fact i think our uh, overall growth expectation is about 27 percent for for this region as a whole and and actually if you look at the economic forecast for this region their post-covid recovery is, is a bit bit delayed because they had sharp uh, rises uh, uh, in covid infections only 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 later in 2020 and also in 2021 so um, so uh, most most of these countries actually expect higher higher gdp growth in 2022 than in 2021 uh, as opposed to the rest of the world where where you know the, the GDP recovery peaked in 2021 and and slowing down this year, and also you know this region has a has a sharply declining domestic production profile. So in the short term, they have really uh, very few options other than to to um, uh, you know uh, keep importing LNG and 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 uh, you know try to substitute it wherever they can with 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 other fuels, uh, but but really the switching between uh, gas and oil is is, uh, is limited and has already been largely exhausted so so um, 
you know, to the extent they have um, uh, contracted supply and, and to the extent they have sectoral demand that is not particularly sensitive to, to uh, feedstock costs, uh, I think they will keep importing LNG regardless of the high prices, which we have already seen in 2021 happening. So, so uh, despite the fact that uh, that uh, so these record prices, both Pakistan and Bangladesh increased their LNG imports last year. Sorry, I do have some issues with my internet connection today. Um, can you hear me? More or less, Anne Sophie. I think you're breaking up a little bit. I do apologize. Okay, apologies for that. Uh, I mean, I, I just wanted to rebound uh, on, on some of the things, I mean, that uh, you said. So uh, the fact that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, and, and this is a question for, for Andrew. I mean, uh, we have seen also a lot of LNG activity, especially coming from China, uh, which has, you know, I, I mean, uh, basically been contracting a lot of LNG uh, last year. I mean, how, how do you see this being a reaction uh, to the very high spot LNG prices? And how much do you see that being basically a reaction to the fact that, I mean, they, they still see, you know, an, an important growth for, for the Chinese market uh, going forward? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question, Anne Sophie. And really, you know, only, the only people who truly know are the buyers themselves who've made the decisions. All I can, all I can say is looking at the data, and this is kind of what we're doing on all of this, looking at the data, the market, the data tells us what, how do we interpret it? We, we at Chenier, and it depends exactly how you kind of count the contracts, but, but our number is that there was about 50 million tonnes of long-term uh, volumes contracted last year, which is certainly um, a good year for contracts, a lot, a lot more than was contracted the year before. Uh, under the kind of uncertainty, the, the uncertainty of the kind of pandemic uh, year of 2020. And then if you look at the, the kind of breakdown of those volumes, the makeup of those volumes, China was a huge piece of that 50 million tonnes. It's about 20 million tonnes of long-term Chinese contracts. So clearly the uh, Chinese buyers deciding uh, in the mar present market conditions, that, that it represents tailwinds, that this is the right time to contract. Chenier has um, made some long-term um, sales to Chinese uh, counterparties this year. Other US um, projects have. Qatar has. On the supply side, the big moving pieces, US uh, contracts, Qatari contracts as they renegotiate existing supplies or... or um, put in place new long-term contracts. And then alongside the Chinese on the market side, the portfolio players and the trading houses, uh, another big piece, the market intermediaries. So I, th I think it's, you kind of have to look at that and go, okay, part of that is um, business that was probably underway anyway. And the, the timing happened to fall in 2021. But I think you know, a big piece of that is that the current market conditions says to buyers, um, probably it's a time to think about your balance of spot versus long-term contracts for LNG. What's your risk appetite to exist in the volatility and prices that, that we've seen and think about the future um, and how you want to balance your, your uh, LNG portfolio. We've been advocates for a long time of saying, you know, we, we agree with buyers that they, they need to diversify their risk in terms of supply, LNG, uh, locations, sources, indexation, and then term, short-term, long-term spot. And the risk appetite, you know, determines, okay, how much long-term versus spot do I want? Clearly we're seeing buyers, I think, re reassess that and, and rebalance some of their uh, future uh, portfolios on, in terms of long-term commitments. I don't know whether we've, we've lost yes. Anne-Sophie. I don't know whether... Um, no, I no, I'm... 
I'm oh, here. Okay. I've decided to switch off uh, my camera in order to have a better connection. Uh, I'm, I'm still with you, and I'm going now to take uh, some of the questions that I am seeing on the chat. Uh, I mean, you know, there were a lot of references, of course, to your uh, report, uh, "America to the Rescue," and I think uh, people will be very happy if you can provide the link to the report. Uh, but also, I mean, it's it seems also to to some people that you know the "American to the Rescue" was also driven by a higher net backs for U.S. LNG suppliers. Um, and I mean, if you compare you know, between Europe and Asia. So, I mean, do you still expect the US to supply Europe if Asian gas prices are higher and provide a higher net back? Obviously not if they provide a higher net back, but, but actually because of the proximity, uh, the, um, the, the TTF premium doesn't have to be positive. I think, I think it just has to be close enough to the, to the Asian, Asian uh, benchmark to, to incentivize US LNG to flow to the European market at times. So, um, so but obviously uh, the main feature of the US LNG and, and that's, that's the, that's the um, uh, inherent nature of its flexibility that it goes wherever the net back price is the highest. And, and uh, you know, if, if we have a cold spell in Asia or, 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 or another type of demand spike, then, then obviously it will, it will flow again, or Europe will have to provide a higher price for, for, for that LNG to, to continue to flow to Europe. So obviously this flexible, flexible LNG supply comes, comes at a high price. And, and if, if market is tight elsewhere, then, then that, that price is even higher. I mean, uh, uh, commenting on again uh, on, on the LNG side. I mean, uh, what what we can also see is that uh, I mean, uh, the US LNG. I mean, uh, has come to the market, but I mean, the, the result are, are very uh, high gas prices. I mean, what would have happened if the EU couldn't have topped the Asian premium this winter? I mean, let's imagine you know Asia would have been extremely cold, like it was at the beginning of 2021. What would have happened? Where would prices be now? 60, 70? Well, it's really hard to tell because uh, as th th this is where it puts us in a, in a place where market is really, really um, getting out of, out of balance and, and we can see extremes, uh, which we didn't think possible before. And, and so, you know, if, if, if the market runs out of gas, then, then we can see anything north of $100 per MMBTU. So uh, it's, it's really hard to speculate because, because uh, once we get to that rarefied area uh, where liquidity thins out and, and, and pretty much everyone disappears from the market except those who are desperately in need of gas and, and have no option for fuel substitution. Uh, I think it's, it's really hard to speculate about prices, but, but obviously um, in, in this situation, um, a combination of very high prices and, 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 and demand destruction will, will, will have to balance the market one way or another. Yeah, I mean, what was also quite interesting, and I think there is a reference to that, is, you know, I mean, the fact that uh, in your forecast, you, you still have some growth from industrial users, but I mean, they have been particularly impacted by, uh, by very high gas prices. We have seen already some demand destruction. So, I mean, to what extent do you expect that to continue? I think, I think uh, what the this sort of price levels that we currently have already already exerted that 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 impact so unless they they rise higher i think i think uh, you know do you mention where, where where the futures curve indicate the prices will be next year i think i think uh, this, this this sort of demand destruction has um, more or less more or less um, reach, reached its potential so um, so in our forecast, we, we do, do not envision too much more, um, but, um, but, but yeah, if, if, if prices rise, rise uh, even further than, than expected or, or envisioned in the forward curve, then, then obviously there is, there is, there is more, to, more to consider. Yes, of course. I mean, uh, Tatiana, just to come back on one question, comment from, from Mike Schulwood. I mean, uh, you know, the fact that we have seen a very low, uh, or, or I mean, absolutely no flows going through Belarus and very low flows coming from Ukraine. I mean, you know, to what extent is that, uh, uh, I mean, a feedback uh, or basically a consequence coming from the very low nominations? And I mean, what does that mean in terms of basically fulfilling the long-term contracts in 2022? To because in ACO's present, uh, presentation, I mean, they will be higher, uh, 
higher uh, flows coming from Russia to Europe in 2022 compared to 2021? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question, but if you look back uh, into the uh, report which uh, Akash was presenting today, uh, you can find uh, there, I think it is like page 68, uh, the uh, chart with the uh, pipeline deliveries from Russia, which shows also the dynamics for 2020. And you can see there that actually the year 2021 wasn't extraordinary, the Q4. Yeah, there were similar reductions in 2020 driven by COVID. Uh, so um, there is some flexibility inside the year. And uh, one month, January, which we are observing right now, uh, I think it's not yet uh, defining the whole year 2022. Indeed, there is very uh, visible reduction in uh, deliveries uh, uh, to Europe uh, through Ukraine, uh, through Belarus. As far as I know, it's uh, not yet disclosed uh, in detail by Gazprom. This is due to lower nominations, which makes a lot of sense because uh, the prices in January are reflecting actually those record uh, prices from December. So Gazprom is mainly uh, indexing its uh, long-term contracts to month ahead. So uh, I hope that it's just uh, uh, a spike in January, maybe first half of February, but uh, hopefully that will more or less normalize uh, in the next few months. Though, again, I mean, look at the geopolitics and pray that it will all be settled down because uh, it's indeed some uh, extraordinary background for all the negotiations. But from the purely commercial side, I think uh, it is just a temporary uh, for turbulation, which will uh, normalize. And of course, I mean, there is a 100 question. I mean, you know, what are your predictions about Nord Stream? I mean, we know that based on the certification process, it's unlikely to become operational before summer. But I mean, do you, will it ever become operational? Yeah, it's again, uh, it's reflecting this crazy world where most of the natural gas discussions in international trade uh, get somehow linked to geopolitical discussions. I mean, from the rational point of view, it was making a lot of sense to have Nord Stream this winter operational, right? Uh, but it's not, and uh, it, it is postponed, so now uh, it is mentioned like middle of 2020, and again, no guarantees, so the bureaucratic process can last uh, really for really long time. Um, as the heating season will end, I think the pressure on the prices will not be that high, but um, I hope that, uh, again, I'm really blessing that the whole geopolitical mess will be somehow settled down. And then that between uh, Russia, Ukraine, NATO, Europe, so it, it is really a very complicated geopolitical game. But hopefully once it is more or less calmed down, there would be, as a part of this solution, some decision on Nord Stream 2 making it operational, because from the purely technical point of view, of course, that would help to stabilize European uh, situation. Thank you very much, Tatiana. Uh, I mean, I think we are coming to the close of uh, this panel. I mean, it was a very interesting discussion. And I know that there are a lot of questions that we have not been able to answer. So apologies for that. Uh, so thank you again to our speakers for joining us today. And thank you to our audience for tuning in. As we mentioned, the full video recording of this event will be available on the Center on Global Energy website in a few days. Our next event, ESG in Emerging Markets, a discussion with leading women from the energy sector will be held tomorrow, February the 2nd at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, for a full calendar of upcoming events, uh, visit the Center of Global Poli Energy Policy online. Uh, I think uh, we have already put uh, some, some things on the chat box, and we hope very much that you enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>